Um, many of you will already will already know who Shane Claiborne is. He he came to speak at Gastry a couple of years ago, and we are so so pleased that he's come again uh, this Sunday. And if you don't know who Shane is, Shane lives in uh, Philadelphia in the U.S. He is a, a speaker. He's an activist. Uh, and an amazing author, he campaigns in the U.S. Uh, around gun laws and um, the, uh, the, the abolition of the death sentence in, in America. And he is hugely inspiring, hugely inspiring. And if you haven't read any of his books, please do go and check them out at the table at the end. Um, do you ever, have you ever read one of those books where you remember exactly where you, where you were when you read it because it impacted you so much? Well, I rem remember vividly reading The Irresistible Revolution several years ago now, and it is not an overstatement to say that it massively changed the way that I live out my Christian faith. I cannot recommend it to you more highly. Uh, this is Shane's latest book, Rethinking Life. Uh, again, fantastic a resource, brilliantly challenging for our time. Uh, and so do have a look at those at the table at the back. But why don't we give Shane a massively warm welcome. It is so good to be back here. It's been a few years, but it's great to be back. Feels like home. Uh, I'm also just glad to be out of the United States uh, where you have things like health care crazy, you know, and um, I'm always just glad to get through that border crossing too, Tim. You know, I, I, I've got stamps in my passport, you know, going as a Christian peacemaker to try to stop the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. So I've got all these stamps in there and I usually uh, get pulled into the secondary questioning, you know, and then they ask me questions like, have you ever been arrested? I'm like, yeah, but for good stuff, you know? So I, I was like, they said, like what? I said, well, we were protesting the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. They're like, oh, interesting. Anything else? I'm like, uh, yeah, there's others. I said, we were, you know, arrested at the Supreme Court for doing a pray-in and praying that we would stop executing people in our country. They said, anything else? I said, well, yeah, we got arrested at the White House because we were... Um, praying and protesting our uh, immigration policies and the way we were treating people on the border. And uh, my favorite moment was when they were like, welcome to our country. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I, you know, I, I grew up such a, a well-behaved person and I grew up in the heart of the Bible Belt in East Tennessee. And I, I embarrassed myself earlier because I shared one of the songs that we grew up with. I, what I love about being at Gas Street is you know how to sing. You know, you know how to worship. You're creating beautiful music. We had not beautiful music when I was growing up in youth group. We had songs like, um, we had this one that said, if I had a little bitty box to put my Jesus in, I'd take him out and hug him tight and share him with a friend. The second verse, verse is very much worse. It says, if I had a little bitty box to put the devil in, I'd take him out and stomp his face and put him back again. And we wonder why Christians are so aggressive. You know, I mean, it was that stuff, it shapes us. And, and we also like, I, I mean, I had a, sincere, powerful conversion, you know, an encounter with the Holy Spirit that, that started my faith. And then, but I, I started to see all the clutter, right? All the stuff. Growing up, we had t-shirts and bumper stickers. You had to get all new music, right? So they gave us literally these charts, a poster, and it said, you're not to listen to worldly, secular music anymore. So you got to burn all of your tapes. We had cassette tapes. These were things that you listened to music on uh, before there were CDs. And that was, but never mind. And so like we, you know, we burned all of our tapes and we, we traded them up. And then I can remember, you got the Christian counterfeit. And it was like, this does not sound like Black Sabbath. Um, I did that on purpose, Birmingham, you know, because Ozzy Osbourne from here, and I, that was my, my people. So you listen to this music, and it wasn't always great, I, uh, but there was some good music. I remember Rich Mullins, he said, uh, he was a great singer and songwriter, and he goes, I hear some of these Christians that say, God gave me this song, and then you listen to it, and you know why God gave it away, uh, because, <laughs> but, you know, there was other stuff. There was all the, the stuff you bought. We even had Christian candy. I kid you not, you can't make this up. We had, it was called Testaments. 
It was like literally a mint wrapped up in a Bible verse, right? And we, I mean, just all of this stuff. And, and you, you had all this consumerism and, and it was branded with Jesus, but it didn't always look like Jesus. You know, we had televangelists that had private planes and we had mega church pastors that had bodyguards. We had uh, folks that uh, we were infatuated with all this big stuff and it was still often about the materialism. And yet through all the clutter of it, I remember a preacher saying, if we find ourselves climbing the ladder of success and status and upward mobility, we better be careful or else on our way up, we might pass Jesus on his way down. Because the story of the gospel is about a God who left the comfort of heaven to join the struggle here on earth, who was born as a homeless baby, refugee, with brown skin in Palestine, marginalized, who was executed on a cross, came from a neighborhood where they said nothing good could come. It's a God who stands in solidarity with the suffering, the hurting people of the world. So I kept leaning into that Jesus, right? I kept leaning into that Jesus. And, uh, but I wanted to see what it looked like because everything I saw in the church was about believing in Jesus. It was even our language. Are you a believer? Is your mom a believer? And I began to say that we were making believers, but we weren't necessarily forming disciples. And Jesus didn't just come to make believers, but to, uh, to form disciples. And so when we started going, you know, I mean, I, I was like a cool kid. I, I was, uh, prom king, not to impress you because it was such a small town, but like, I, that's what I was after, you know? And then I started reading the, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, uh, if we want to be the greatest, become the least, right? We saw Jesus saying, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And I started going, any, does anyone actually do that, you know? And, and so I, I wanted to know, like, where, where, what does it look like to follow Jesus? And I read about all these great saints that had already passed away, you know, St. Francis of Assisi and, uh, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Dorothy Day and all these wonderful folks, but we were going, who's doing it now? And my college friends and I, we, uh, we kept being really fascinated by Mother Teresa. This woman who at the time was like 80 years old, you know, a Catholic nun who had left everything. They said everything she had was in a box. And she went to Calcutta, India and began to care for what she called the poorest of the poor, folks who had leprosy and skin diseases, folks that were ostracized in every way. Uh, she, she began to lift people off the streets and the first home that she started was called the home for the dying where they just held people's hands as they died so that they wouldn't die alone without anybody looking at the into their eyes with love. And uh, we, we, you know, we're 18. We're like, let's go work with Mother Teresa. So we write her a letter and we never heard back, but that didn't stop us because you're 18, nothing's impossible, right? So I just started calling nuns on the phone. Said, I'm trying to get a hold of Mother Teresa. And I finally get this nun, I kid you not, who gives me a phone number and tells me I need to call in the night. So it'll be like in the middle of the day in India. And I do it. And I was calling from a pay phone. I mean, this is before the internet and cell phones and all that. And I, I like, Young people, pay phones for things you put uh, money in, you know, and you call and uh, Banksy uses them for art now. You know, anyway, so we're, um, you know, I, we're, I'm calling from a pay phone and it's $3 a minute. So I'm thinking I'm going to make it quick, you know, and, and it rings and I'm expecting just sort of a polite receptionist, you know, like missionaries of charity. How can I help you? But I just hear, hello. And I'm thinking I got the wrong number, you know, and I said, listen, I, I'm calling from the United States and we're trying to get a hold of Mother Teresa or some of the nuns in Calcutta because we want to come work. We're trying to figure out how to, how to love our neighbor and follow Jesus. And, and she says, well, this is Mother Teresa. And at that moment, I was like, yeah, right. And I'm the Pope, you know, but I kept talking to her and she's, and I said, we want to, we want to come work. And she said, come on out. How long can you stay? And I said, we were going to stay all summer. She's like, that's a long time. I was like, or a few hours, whatever, you know, and we went and we spent the whole summer there, you know, and I worked in that home for the dying where we, we began to, to 
hold people and whisper God's love to them. And I worked in the orphanages uh, that Mother Teresa had started rescuing kids that were abandoned in train stations. And Oh, I mean, it, it shaped me. It formed me uh, as we, you know, came back to Philly. But one of the things that, you know, I, I remember about Mother Teresa, sometimes folks go, well, you know, what was that like? What was it like to meet Mother Teresa? She was like this tall. When, when I first met her, I just wanted to hug her, but I had to not break her, you know, so I'm just kind of doing one of these little pats. But uh, I, you know, I, I remember one of the things I will never forget about Mother Teresa. She was in prayer almost every morning. We would get up at five o'clock in the morning, which is not my favorite hour, but you know, I did it. Get it, come in, go to prayer. And we would take off all of our shoes at the door because it was holy ground. You know, it was space where we would come in barefoot and we would kneel before the cross. And every morning we would begin our day with prayers that Jesus would fill us with the Holy Spirit, that we would, we, this is one of the prayers we prayed every morning. Dear Jesus, may every person I come in contact with feel your presence in my soul. May I leave off your fragrance everywhere I go. But sometimes my mind would wander a little bit, and I, I did notice, um, you know, that I, I, Mother Teresa's feet were deformed, and I noticed them because we were barefoot, and I was sitting right behind her one day, and, and I wondered almost if she had contracted leprosy or something because of how deformed her feet were, and, um, but yeah, I mean, it's Mother Teresa, so I'm not, I'm not about to be like, what's up with your feet, you know, and so like, we were talking with one of the nuns, though, and she said, her feet are deformed because we get just enough donated shoes for everybody to get a pair, and there's not usually many left over. And we live out of donations just like our neighbors. And they said, she said, so Mother Teresa goes through all the donated shoes and she picks out one of the worst pairs for herself. And after years and years of making sure everybody else had the best shoes they could, it's made her feet look like that. And I can remember, you know, rehearsing all of the verses I knew so well of honoring the needs of others above our own, loving my neighbor as myself, but I'd not quite seen someone take it that literally, right? That Mother Teresa, you know, she would, I can remember when we would donate clothes to the Salvation Army or something, you'd give the pants that had the tear in them, the zipper didn't quite work on the jacket, you'd give it to the Salvation Army or something because it, it doesn't really work. And Mother Teresa had a totally different way of thinking of everything, right? She said, no, when you give to the poor, you should give the best jacket in your closet because you're giving it to Jesus. And it, it began to change everything. I, I, it wasn't just Mother Teresa, but we hung out with kids all the time. It's so great to see the kids up here. You know, we, we, um, my job in India became throwing a party for the kids every Tuesday night. And uh, we'd get like 150 kids together that lived on the street. These were kids that were homeless. They were eight years old, 10 years old, survived from begging. And Mother Teresa said, they, they haven't always been convinced of how precious they are. So we get to convince them of how precious they are. So we threw on this banquet, massive amounts of food. We'd play games and I got a few circus skills that I, you know, keep in my back pocket. But, uh, you know, we're juggling, we're turning flips, we're doing all this stuff with the kids. And then one, one day, one Tuesday night, one of the kids says to me, it's my birthday. And I could see his whole countenance just begin to cry. He's not gonna get anything for his birthday, you know, which put me in an awkward place because there's like, 150 kids, you're not supposed to get gifts for them because you got, uh, you know, so many of them. You don't play favorites. And yet I'm like, it's a kid's birthday. So I sneak off. I'm thinking to myself, I'll just get something little. I'll pull them aside. So I, I pull them over and I go, I give them an ice cream cone. I'm like, happy birthday, man. <laughs> what I didn't anticipate was how excited he would be, right? It had been a long time since he had ice cream. So he gets it and he's just like, <laughs> and then his impulse, his instinct is that this is too good to keep for myself. So he yells at all the other kids, we've got ice cream, you know, and he lines them up and he goes, everybody's going to get a lick. <laughs> the brother literally goes down the line, gives everybody a lick of ice cream and then comes full circle back to me. It's melting all down his hand. He goes, Shane, we saved you a lick too. <laughs> I'm like, awesome. You know, I've got this whole spit aversion thing, but I, I, I went for it. You know, I went all in. Yeah. And, and, and that kid knew the secret, right? That mother Teresa knew that Jesus knew the best thing to do with the best things in life 
is give them away. If we want to find our life, we lose it. If we want to get rich, we give all of our material possessions away. And yet it flies in the face of everything we hear in the world, right? Even in the church sometimes. From this kind of self-obsessed, narcissistic, prosperity gospel that's more interested in what we can get from God than what we can give to the world. So I came back, you know, inspired. And I learned about Gandhi too when I was there. Gandhi, who, you know, read the Sermon on the Mount every single morning, he said, and took Jesus more seriously than many Christians do, right? And I, one of the stories of Gandhi was he rode third class on all the trains in India, right? And someone once asked him, why do you ride third class on the trains? And Gandhi said, because there is no fourth class. A different way of thinking of the world, right? And I'm convinced that that's what Jesus does to us is reorient us, right? So I came back to Philly. I mean, we got our, that fire in our bones and we started our community and we started doing, you know, what Mother Teresa said, we're not called to do great things, but small things with great love. And that's what we sought to do. We're welcoming homeless folks. We got folks coming out of domestic violence. We're doing, you know, community gardens. We've been doing it for 25 years now. But there came a moment too where compassion began to also lead us to justice because we began to ask, what's hurting our brothers? Why are they hungry to begin with? You know, as Martin Luther King said, we're all called to be the good Samaritan and lift our neighbor out of the ditch. But after you lift so many people out of the ditch, you start to say, we got to do something about the road to Jericho. Uh, we got to do something about why people keep landing in the ditch. And, and in Philadelphia, one of the justice issues was the policies and the laws that we were passing that were hurting the homeless. One of those was that all over our country. There are anti-homeless laws that make it illegal to sleep in public, illegal to ask for spare change, illegal. One of the laws in Philly was a food ordinance that made it illegal to give out food. You literally couldn't get some pizzas and go to a park and share them. And so we said, these laws are wrong. And, you know, St. Augustine said, an unjust law is no law at all. Uh, we've got to be faithful to Jesus, even when the laws of this land are out of whack. So we said, we want to do it with humility, but we, we, we need to challenge these systemic things. And so we, we decided, uh, we really felt led by the Holy Spirit to start some worship services in a park called Love Park in Philly. So we hung a sign that said, where is the love? And we, we brought our guitars and our drums and we worshiped. And then we served communion after worship, which was tricky because you're not allowed to give out food. If you're Catholic, you think it's a body and blood. So we're just like, we're all Catholic rolling here today, you know, and the police were, I'm glad three of you got the joke. That was, uh, but you know, there's like the police are all around and they're like, I'm not going to arrest them in the middle of communion. In fact, I might need to take communion, you know, and after communion, um, we brought the pizzas in, you know, we continued the fellowship and, and, and there was one night where it was about midnight because we were still in the park. Many of our friends w had gone to sleep. Uh, they had no homes. And so uh, the police surrounded the park and they came in and they arrested all of us. I mean, this is, we're put in handcuffs, taken to jail, had serious charges against us. My mom was not happy. And, uh, and we, we trusted, you know, I mean, there's that scripture that says, don't worry when they drag you before the courts, you're going to, God will give you the word. So we go to court and um, there were dozens of us that were arrested. And one of, some of them were our friends on the street who had no intention of going to jail. They got sucked up in it all. And one of them is a guy named Alfonso, who we all knew as Fonz and he's smooth, you know? So we're like, when we're talking about who's gonna represent us in court, we're like, we told all our, our lawyer friends, come with us, but we want Fonz to represent us, right? So we go to court and... Uh, I got a shirt on as we go to trial that says, Jesus was homeless. And the judge goes, Jesus was homeless? I didn't know that. And I said, yeah, your honor. In the scripture, Jesus says, foxes have holes and birds of the, the, the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. And the judge said, you guys might stand a chance. And uh, we did. Fonzo stood up and Fonz said, on behalf of the group, I'm our spokesperson. I'd like to say, we believe these laws are evil and wrong. <laughs> he sat down and we're like, amen, hallelujah, what he said, you know. And, and the, the district attorney, the prosecutor, she was not impressed by this. She was, uh, 
uh, throwing the book at us. She wanted us to go to jail and actually serve time. She was claiming that we were criminals and had no uh, respect for law and uh, we should be fined thousands of dollars. And this was the kicker. We should have hours and hours of mandatory court-sanctioned community service. <laughs> You're like, don't make us feed the homeless or something. You know, and we, <laughs> but we argue our case and the judge interrupts the whole court trial and he says, listen, you don't have to convince me that these people broke the law. It's really clear to me that they've been breaking the law. But what's in question are, are the laws that we're passing, the rightness, the justice, the goodness of the laws that we're passing that hurt our most vulnerable people. And the judge said, if it weren't for people who broke the bad laws, we wouldn't have the freedom that we have. Have you heard of the civil rights movement and the Underground Railroad? And he said, these guys are not criminals. They're freedom fighters. And I find them all not guilty on every charge. And then he said, and how do I get one of those shirts? <laughs> so we gave him one and we kept praying. We'll get that same judge over and over. But we, you know, I learned in all of that that the call of Jesus can cause us to collide sometimes with the world that we live in. Right? I, I meet folks all the time that, especially that maybe just dedicated their life to Christ and I hear their testimonies and their powerful testimonies. You know, sometimes people will say to me, you know, I was doing all kinds of stuff. I was partying and using drugs. I went to jail. I got locked up, you know, and then, and then I met Jesus. I'm like, God bless you. My story's a little different. I had my life together and I met Jesus and he messed me up, you know. I didn't go to jail before I was a Christian, but I've got a whole time, a lot of time since, you know. I, but that's the good trouble, right? Martin Luther King, one of my, my heroes, Martin Luther King, who was deeply fueled by his faith. He was a pastor, right? A lover of Jesus. He said, when I first went to jail for fighting against racism, he said, it disturbed me to go to jail. But then I looked at history and I saw what good company I have behind bars. Because Christians have often been holy troublemakers, right? The good trouble, the holy mischief, the folks that do not accept the world as it is, but insist on building the world that God dreams of, fighting for equality, amplifying the voices of the margins, building the kind of world that God wants. Uh, at one point, Martin Luther King, um, someone tried to throw an insult at him and they called him maladjusted. And he so beautifully took that insult and flipped it on its head and made it a compliment. And he said, uh, maybe you're right. I am maladjusted. He said, because we live in a world that has become way too adjusted to racism. We've become way too adjusted to injustice. We've become way too comfortable with other people's suffering. We've become way too complacent with the ravaging of the earth. We've become way too comfortable with the inequity between the rich and the poor. We need some holy, maladjusted people. Amen? I think part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is as Romans says, not to conform to the patterns of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, right? To live with new imagination. And so I, I think today I'm always challenged because I think what I saw in my own life was I was good at worshiping Jesus, but not as good at following him. And there's a difference between being a worshiper of Jesus and a follower of Jesus. I love seeing the bags out there that say, I have decided to follow Jesus. We just sang it, right? That, that we want to follow Jesus because the scripture says we can have faith to move mountains and speak in the tongues of men and of angels and do all sorts of miracles and prophecies. But if we don't have love, it's still empty. It says we can sing all of our songs, but if justice doesn't flow out like a river and righteousness like an ever flowing stream, it's just a sounding gong, right? We need that justice to flow out of worship. I mean, in the end, uh, according to Jesus in Matthew 25, he says, all of us are going to be gathered before God and we're going to be asked a few questions. And my friend Tony Campolo says, 
they're not doctrinal questions. It's interesting as you read Matthew 25, it's not that God's going to say to us, uh, okay, virgin birth, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. We might wish that it was a theological test. To, that'd be easy. We'd all pass. But the question we're going to be asked is, when I was in prison, did you visit me? When I was a stranger, did you welcome me in? When I was an immigrant, an asylum seeker, how did you treat me? Did you give me food when I was hungry? Did you give me health care when I needed it? That the real test of our faith is how it matters to the most hurting person in our world. And, and I want to say that uh, I'm always careful to, to say that our works don't earn our salvation. Our salvation is through Christ alone, but our works demonstrate our salvation. And if they don't have meaning to those who are hurting in the streets and in the jails and uh, victims of war, then maybe we're just believers but not followers. And why, why, I, I love being here at Gastry because y'all are working it out. You know that scripture? We're working out our salvation with fear and trembling. We're, we're learning together. We're growing. Conversion's not a moment. It's a movement in us. I'm always excited. You know, this morning I was hearing about some of our, our family from here at Gastry that are from uh, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq. And I, I, one of my most powerful experiences for me, a learning experience was that, that grew my faith was when the U.S. and the U.K. and coalition troops began to declare war on Iraq and Afghanistan in response to 9-11, even though we now know that all the hijackers came from Saudi Arabia and where the U.S. is still selling weapons to Saudi Arabia. But anyway, okay. But we, we began to go to war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, many of us went there to try to stop the war, to be with the people, to volunteer in the hospitals. And uh, that's where I was in March 20 years ago, 2003. We were in Baghdad as 900 bombs a day fell on Baghdad. Saw some of the most... Horrific things I've ever seen. But I want to tell you this. I saw faith like I'd never seen it before. We, we were gathered, packed into this little congregation in Baghdad, Tim, like hundreds of us. So many that people couldn't fit in and they were flowing into the streets holding candles. And Mother Teresa's sisters were there. I remember when I see in the blue and white saris, I was like, you're Mother Teresa's sisters? They're like, yeah. And I said, are you going to leave when the bombs fall? And they said, no, we run an orphanage. We got to stay with the kids. We're with them. They stayed, right? And we had worship services in the middle of the bombing of Baghdad. And I can remember singing Amazing Grace in Arabic and realizing that I'm in holy ground. I, I was so moved. It was one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had that I, I went to the altar afterwards to pray with this bishop. And, and uh, I was, you know, a little charismatic, as I can get sometimes. I know you, it's hard to imagine. But uh, I go up, and I'm, I'm talking 100 miles an hour. I said, man, I've, I've never experienced the, 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 anything like this. I said, and then I said something ignorant. I said, I had no idea that there were so many Christians in Baghdad. And he goes, the bishop was gentle. He goes, this is where it started. And he pointed outside and he goes, that's the Tigris River and the Euphrates. Have you heard of them? And he said, the Garden of Eden is right down the street. Uh, this is a land of your ancestors. And he said, you didn't invent Christianity in America. You just domesticated it. And he said, you go back and you tell the Christians in North America that we are praying for them to remember who they are. And I want to say those words to us today that we, we've got to remember who we are. Right? We've got to look at the words of Jesus again and say, what if he meant the stuff he said? So I think maybe the invitation this morning is let's all go back to Matthew five through seven, the Sermon on the Mount. Let's read it fresh as if we've never read it before and just say, oh, what if Jesus meant these words? We're going to be hanging out. We've got a little movement here called Red Letter Christians because we get our name from, you know, the, the, the Bibles that have the words of Jesus uh, highlighted in red. And uh, it was Mahatma Gandhi, actually, who was asked about Christianity. And he said, I love Jesus. I just wish the Christians acted more like him. 
And we want a Christianity that looks like Jesus again, that loves like Jesus again. My friend, Ash and Ange Barker, they've got a community just around the corner here that I'm staying at. And they'll have information out there because we got we to gotta build this unity so that people can know of God's love. And one of the biggest obstacles to Jesus has been Christians who have so much to say with our mouths and our bumper stickers and our t-shirts, but so little to show of God's love. It doesn't always look like good news, but we want it to be good news. We want to be light in the darkness, right? Or as my friend Stanley Hauerwas says, we want to be like air fresheners in the toilet. This world can stink sometimes, but we want to leave off the fragrance of Jesus. So if you want to follow Jesus, I want to invite you to stand to your feet and we'll pray together. You can, you can stand as you're able. And first, I want to say, holy God, holy, holy, holy God, forgive us. Forgive us when we've reduced, when we've reduced the faith to a doctrinal statement, when we've been worshipers of you, but not followers of you. So do something among us. Reorient our lives, turn our world upside down that we might not be fighting for the top, but fighting for those at the bottom. Make us maladjusted to the things we should never become adjusted to. Help us to stand in solidarity with those in Iraq and Ukraine and Afghanistan and Iran and all over the world who are suffering. They're our family. They're your children. Let our worship do something to us so that justice flows like a mighty river. And if there's anyone in this room who's just hearing the whisper of your love and grace, maybe for the first time, feeling something moving in their hearts. We pray that they would say yes, that we would all say yes in a new way today that we have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.